So we've now covered the basics of the decision of whether to treat with NAC or not. Let's now go over the dosing of NAC once you've made the decision that you are going to treat. So there are lots of different protocols that can be followed for NAC dosing. The protocol that I've always followed is what's known as the SNAP protocol. And this consists of two infusions of NAC that we'll call bag one and bag two. And how much NAC is in each of these infusions is based on the patient's weight. So you need to know the patient's weight in kilograms before you can work out the doses. So bag one is going to be 100 mg per kg of NAC. And you put it in 200 milliliters of fluid that will be 0.9% sodium chloride, so normal saline. And you give that over two hours. So let's go over this in more detail. So if the patient, say, weighs 70 kilograms, you'd multiply 100 by 70, so you'd get 7,000 milligrams. The person making this infusion would then get 7,000 milligrams and put it, dissolve it, into a 200 milliliter bag of normal saline. And then they would run that bag intravenously into the patient over a period of two hours. So that's the first infusion. Once the first infusion has finished, you then commence the second infusion. The second infusion is slower, but also has more NAC in it. So you have 200 mg per kg of NAC in the second bag, but the second bag is going to be a bigger bag of fluid, so it's going to be a liter of fluid. Again, we'll use normal saline, so 0.9% sodium chloride, and it's run over 10 hours rather than two hours. So again, if we have our 70 kilogram patient, then we'd multiply 200 by 70 to get uh, 14,000. So you'd want 14,000 milligrams of NAC to be put into this litre bag of normal saline, and then that needs to be run over 10 hours. And you only commence bag two once bag one has finished. So overall, the whole thing will take just over 12 hours, budgeting in the time in between for taking down bag one and putting up bag two. So after these two infusions of NAC are complete, you then repeat blood tests on the patient, and we call these blood tests the post-NAC bloods. And these are going to determine whether the patient is now fit to be discharged or whether they need to have a further infusion of NAC. Now, the free blood tests that we're really interested in in the post-NAC bloods are the same free blood tests that we we're interested in when we were deciding whether to give NAC in the first place. So we're interested in the paracetamol level, the ALT value, and the INR value. Now, if all three of these come back in acceptable ranges, then you don't need to give the patient further NAC. They can be discharged. If even one of them comes back in an unacceptable range, then they go on and have another bag of NAC, another infusion, which we'll call bag three. And bag three is an exact copy of bag two. So again, you give 200 mg per kg of NAC in a litre of normal saline over 10 hours. And then after that third bag of NAC, you then do more post-NAC blood tests. And again, it remains the case that if all of these three things are acceptable now after that third bag of NAC, then the patient can be discharged. Whereas if any of them are unacceptable, then you go on to the fourth bag of NAC, and the fourth bag of NAC is again a duplicate of bag two. So 200 mg per kg infused in over 10 hours. After that fourth bag of NAC, you then repeat the post-NAC blood test again, and if they still remain deranged at that point, you need to seek senior help, senior advice, consultant advice. In my experience, I've only ever seen one patient who had to then have further bags of NAC after the fourth bag of NAC, and it was an extremely complicated case. It was complicated by non-compliance. The patient uh, was absconding, um, and going home and taking more paracetamol and then having to be brought back by the police. So it was incredibly complicated, refusing cannulation, refusing blood tests, refusing the NAC. So it was extremely complicated. Um, all the other cases where the patient has been compliant, I've never seen them get to that stage where they had to have a fourth bag of NAC and then even after the fourth bag of NAC, the blood tests were still deranged.
So let's now discuss what are the acceptable ranges for these to come back as in the post nac bloods. So let's begin with paracetamol. So the acceptable range for paracetamol is less than 10 milligrams per litre. So if you measure the paracetamol level post the second infusion that comes back as less than 10 milligrams per litre, that is a pass. Now in my experience, usually this one does pass the test. It usually has come down to less than 10 milligrams per litre by the time you do these bloods. Usually if the patient fails these criteria and has to have bag free, it's because one of these two has failed, or usually both of them. Now, the reason for that is because think how much time has actually elapsed. The patient took the overdose, let's say they presented within two hours, like our example patient, we then waited until four hours post ingestion to do the initial blood tests. Those probably took about an hour to come back. So the NAC probably wasn't begun until five hours post ingestion at the earliest. And then these infusions have gone over 12 hours. So that's a long time period that has elapsed since the actual overdose. Now paracetamol does not have that long a half life, hence why you have to take it every four hours to maintain the painkiller effect. So usually it has been significantly excreted by the time that these post nac bloods are done. So in my experience, usually it has come down into the acceptable range by the time these are done. And it usually isn't the reason that the patient fails the post nac bloods and isn't uh, allowed to be discharged and has to instead have bag free of NAC. I think for it to still be greater than 10 milligrams per litre after that second infusion of NAC, it would have to be the case that they would have taken an enormous dose initially or like the example of the patient that I've just been talking about they've been absconding to take more paracetamol they've been taking more paracetamol on the ward somehow so let's now move on to ALT and INR so I said earlier that some people count the normal threshold for ALT to be 30, others count it to be 40, others say in between 35, but certainly if it's greater than 40, that is a raised ALT. Less than 40 is potentially normal. So if ALT comes back raised, that is a marker of hepatocellular injury. So it is a marker that liver cells have been injured by the paracetamol despite the two infusions of NAC that you have given. So what should you do one, you should assess the patient and see whether you are worried about them having potentially suffered hepatonecrosis. Now, indicators of hepatonecrosis would be the patient should be really starting to become very unwell and they will have a lot of abdominal pain in the right upper quadrant, i.e. over the liver region. If the patient remains incredibly well and hasn't got any abdominal pain, then it is probably the case that they are absolutely fine and some liver cells have been injured, released some ALT into the blood, but that doesn't necessarily mean that hepatonecrosis is occurring. I have seen ALTs up in the thousands on post nac bloods, and the patient has not been going through hepatonecrosis. They've been absolutely fine. So ALT can go through the roof. There are very few things, by the way, that are able to put your ALT up into the thousands. Paracetamol overdose and liver injury from the paracetamol overdose is one of the only things that is able to do that. Uh, but it doesn't indicate hepatonecrosis. But it certainly means that you should assess the patient and see if you are worried about hep possible hepatonecrosis. And it certainly indicates that they should have a third bag of NAC. INR. INR should be less than 1.3, as we said earlier. If it's greater than 1.3, that again is an indicator that you should assess the patient for hepatonecrosis. Now, in reality, generally, if the patient does have hepatonecrosis, INR will be massively deviated, usually greater than 6.5. Um, so if it's only mildly raised, and in all the cases that I've ever seen, it has only been mildly raised, you know, 1.9, 1.6, maybe into the twos. If it's mildly indicated, that is certainly an indicator that you should assess them for hepatonecrosis, but if they are clinically fine and haven't got any abdominal pain, then they're probably absolutely fine, and therefore you just give them a third bag of NAC. So these two being raised, you should assess them for hepatonecrosis, and if you think they're absolutely fine, then you should just commence the third bag of NAC. If you are worried that they could be suffering from hepatonecrosis, then you need to get your senior involved and go down that route of potentially trying to diagnose that and referring them to a centre that can actually handle that, a liver transplantation centre.
So to finish with, let's just summarise what we've seen here. So you begin with the first two infusions of NAC, everyone gets those. Then after the second infusion is complete, you do post-NAC blood tests. You measure the paracetamol level, you measure the ALT value and the INR value. If all three of these come back in acceptable ranges, then the patient passes the post-NAC bloods. They don't need to have further NAC treatment and they are now ready to be discharged. And in my experience, most patients do pass the post-NAC bloods. In the patients who fail to pass the post-NAC bloods, only one of them needs to be outside of the acceptable range and you then class that as a fail and you're going to go on to the third bag of NAC. Now, in my experience, usually it's not the paracetamol level that causes the patient to fail the post-NAC bloods if they are going to fail them. It's usually one of these two and quite often both of them. Usually if one of these is deranged, the other one will be deranged too. If ALT and INR come back deranged, then one, you should assess the patient for her patinecrosis, and you do that, as I've previously described, by clinically looking at them, seeing how well they are, assessing them for abdominal pain. Also, what I didn't say previously is you would do further blood tests in someone that were worried about hepatonecrosis and you wanted to assess that. So if the liver is truly dying, other abnormalities occur on blood test. So in particular, lactate goes through the roof. And I'll write some of these down. So lactate goes through the roof. pH goes down because the lactate is going up. So lactate is an acid. So it causes the pH of the blood to go down. So you measure the pH of the blood as well. You get these on a VBG blood test, a venous blood gas. Other things, creatinine tends to go through the roof if hepatonecrosis is occurring. So that's the other crucial one that you'd look at. So if these are normal, that's also massively reassuring that the patient isn't undergoing hepatonecrosis. If these are starting to deviate, then yes, get your senior involved and get them to come and assess and see what they think. So you assess for hepatonecrosis. If you've ruled that out, you don't think that that's occurring, then these arrangements do indicate that the patient needs a further bag of NAC. So you give bag three, which is a copy of bag two. After bag three, then repeat post-NAC bloods. You do all of these again. And if now they're all in acceptable ranges, then the patient can be discharged. If any one of them remains abnormal, then that indicates that they need a fourth bag of NAC, which is again a copy of bag two. And again, you need to reassess and make sure that you don't believe that they've got hepatonecrosis if it is the ALT or the INR that is remains deranged. Then after bag four of NAC, they have post-NAC bloods again. And again, if they're normalised now in the acceptable range, then the patient can be discharged. If they remain abnormal, then you need, to, again, to escalate this to a senior, get a senior involved. So that completes what I know about treating paracetamol overdoses with N-acetylcysteine. So we'll complete the video there. Thank you for watching.